Well, welcome everyone to um, a wonderful Sabbath. I thank you for all coming today. Um, it's um, it's a wonderful privilege to um, present something to you that's dear to my heart. So what we're talking about today is that scripture from the dust, and this is the title, from the dust, down hill, to the princes of his people. And you can see some people here, they're hungry, they're wanting help, and they're saying, God bless you. So, before we begin, I just wanted to say that so far what we have talked about today in Sabbath School and lots of things is, it's fitting into what I'm going to present today. The things we've covered uh, are aspects that will fit in to what we've already talked about today. So, before we begin, may we kneel in prayer. Those who can kneel, may we kneel. Dear Heavenly Father, as we, as we come before you, we just thank you for your dear Son that you gave to us, that you're able to set the captives free. You have said this in your word, that you can restore in man the image that you, that of your character completely to all classes, to everybody. It is available for total restoration for the restitution of all things. As a people, may we know what your message is, how you can work in our hearts, and the method of which you accomplish this. I pray that you give us your spirit, your angels as a church, to go forward and to follow you in every way. I just pray again that these words may not fall on deaf ears. I pray, because you have said in your word, you will have a most glorious church. You will have a most brilliant message, but also that comes with teaching the people, the witness. That witness, before the gospel goes to all the world, is a witness in our own individual lives and to everybody that wants to be part and to be part of the 144,000. For this is our message, to raise up this message before you come. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. When we look back in church history, in trying to bring about the second coming of Christ, And I just want to summarise just some aspects that have happened since our church history. This is not necessarily in order um, of events, but it's just basic summaries of um, certain things. Um, so one is the commandments and grace. Initially when the church started there was a lot of talk about the commandments and yet grace was not left. It was left off and not really um, brought to its full um, fruition. It was out of balance. And then there was some sort of balance made between the two. Then the other aspect between faith and works. A lot of emphasis on faith. Um, but then works was not really taught. There was an imbalance there. And then there was the aspect of war prophecy. Looking at the prophecy, pointing out um, all the aspects of prophecy. Maybe prophecy was going to bring about the second coming of Christ. And then the sanctuaries. There was a, a study and studies in relation to the sanctuaries that um, Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary and there was an importance that yes, we're going to put our importance in the, in the heavenly sanctuary. Christ is up there. But then people said, but we are a sanctuary. And they said, well, the health message and so forth, we need to have, we are a sanctuary. So then the message became lopsided again. So, but the importance is, yes, there is a sanctuary in heaven, and we are a sanctuary ourselves. God wants to dwell in us. Number five was exposing the beast. A lot of people thought, well, if you expose the beast, 
and you expose everything in regards to that image of the beast and therefore Sunday law will come and therefore people will be converted and therefore Christ will come. So I, I know a lot of people, maybe about 20 years ago, they were talking about this, a lot about um, Christian liberties and how the, the church was robbed with Christian liberties through uh, the beast power, uh, through the Roman church. And they put studies, they put pamphlets together, they put aspects of Daniel and Revelation, but there was no, not a balance to um, the character of Christ that wasn't in it. They didn't want to know about that. And so therefore, their light went out. All these things, what I'm saying is, these, these particular things, these areas, if you like, are doctrine. And doctrine produces something. It must produce the character of Christ. And notice I'm going to put the letter there, A. A. The character of Christ. So, the purpose of doctrine is so we can surrender our will so God can fully, completely work in us, is the true purpose of doctrine. Now, next thing is B. The question is B. How is the character formed in the church? Okay, so if people, remember those five areas? People were trying to work out that maybe Christ has to come. If we just study those areas, we study doctrine, then Christ has to come. Okay, so people might have an understanding. Okay, they realise that and all that their hopes in that area of producing doctrine has gone nowhere. And so therefore, they say, okay, well, Christ, I can see now Christ's character must have to be in his people before he comes. The next question is, they must say to themselves, how is it formed? If you know, therefore, Christ is going to come, then how, how on earth is that character going to be formed in the church? What, it, what is it going to take to make the saints perfect in Christ? What is it, what is it going to take um, to be like Christ in every way? Now, the 144,000 are a fruit, a demonstration of what it's going to, going to be. doesn't mean to say that, that they're the only ones saved. But like as birds fly in a flock, they lead out. All the other birds are behind following in its train, but they must lead out. So what I wanted to do is I'm going back now to 1997 when I formulated the 12 key principles. Now this is not a full complete study in relation to the 12 key principles, it's only a snapshot because I want to bring other things in with this as well. But this is just a snapshot in regards to the 12 key principles. When I come off uh, medication, about three years after coming off medication, I started to trace those, step, those steps from the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy, and I noticed there was 12. So after three years of coming off medication, I decided to put these 12 things down. I've been off medication somewhere about 17, 18 years now. Okay, so the first one is hope. Most simple. These things are very simple, yet profound, and they're deep. And you'll notice as well, today, when we read 1 Timothy, it said Jesus Christ is our hope. Romans 15.4, if you can turn in your Bibles, it says... Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So the purpose of the scriptures, of their, uh, those principles, are to create a hope. Are to create a hope. Now, that means that if someone was on medication, knowing that there is a scam in regards to what is actually happening, they can come off. People that are the poor and needy, that want to get their lives in order, that have no food, and so forth. There is a hope for them. There is a hope for us in the church. There is a hope for the rich people, that they can do something 
with them, realizing that their riches are of no use. So to all classes, there is a hope that we have to have. And we can apply that hope in various forms. The next point, number two, is do you want to get well? I divided this into two points, two areas, two questions. Do you want to get well? Do we want to get well as a church? Do we want to reflect Christ's character? This is the same thing of getting well. We are sin sick. Do we want to get well? And what would it mean to maintain an even keel or balance? What would you have to do if you realise that there is hope? What are you to do to maintain an even keel? What things would you have to put in place? What faith would you have to have? What love maybe would you have to have? The first point, number one, just backtracking here, it also ties into fear God and give glory to Him. It's all part of that first angel's message. So think about this. Number one is also talking about the first angel's message. What would end? Number two is now a question asked that you can start to do something. Through Christ, if you're on that platform and considering that hope, you can do something about that change. Number three is responsibility. Responsibility. Now, someone that might have um, some sort of ailment, they go to their doctor, and it could be a physical problem, and they're told, well, it's all in the genes, and what about your past family? You know, look, look at what your past, your family situation, you know, it's all in the genes, that's why you got it. But you know that 10% only makes up the genes? Around about 10%, roughly, about 10%. 90% is of you how God has made you, that you are designed, the body is designed to heal itself if, and notice the word if, you give it the right conditions. If. Also too, in regards to responsibility, is psychiatry is also, and these are summaries, this, this is all summary um, of the talk I did in have you been deceived by sorceries? In summary, psychiatry is sorceries. And it's connected to the merchants of the man and it enslaves the souls of men. I'll show you a slide after these 12 points in regards to this. Some foundation was started. The American Psychiatric Association, and I only found this out about two weeks ago, it started in a particular year of our Advent message. It's amazing. Why was it started? You will see that. Now, the thing is in responsibility is that um, this particular um, philosophy says there's something's wrong in your brain and there's something wrong with you. And you need to get that fixed up. But you can't do it through the Bible. You've got to go to appeal or other philosophies. Also, the original sin teachings says the very thing. It says that hereditary or nature is sin. So Satan is very clever in wanting to make man bad. But even though we have sin, and we might have crossed that pathway. We've allowed the hereditary to cross over. Jesus says in John 8, 11, He says, Neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee. What powerful, wonderful words. Neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. Cut it off. Stop it. But first off, getting back to that, number one, you have to have a hope to believe that you can cut it out. You must believe that the Bible can do it for you, the Word of God. What Christ is our hope? We must be prepared if there's something in our lives 
We must, even though it mightn't be totally there yet, we must say, Lord, help me to work this out and cut it off. If we need to follow that through with, with practical ways, let's do it. Okay, the next one, number four, is habits of life. Habits of life. After we are on that platform of Christ, whether we like it or know it, we have our five senses and things are being laid down in our brain, mind, whether we like it or not. The things we watch, the things we don't watch, the more time we spend in the Word of God, the more prayer, because we have our will. We have a will. And we can choose this or that. In 8T, 3.14, it says, We are to form habits of thought that will enable us to resist temptation. We must learn to look upward. So here we have this situation that we have to form habits of thought that will enable us to resist temptation. Habits of thought. If, if there's a problem, whatever it is, we have to um, realise there's a problem and say, Lord, help me. To form a new pathway and he will allow you he will allow this new pathway to be written in us this is what's physically happening whether we like it or not even science says the same things which backs up the Bible and the spirit of prophecy people that are of just not even Christian based um, from science saying the same thing they're saying that our brain is plastic it can form itself it can change itself now think about it this way. If I have a, um, a grass field, a grass field, and there is no tracks in it, it's just grass. If I keep on walking down that pathway, what happens? There'll be a track, won't there? How big would it be? Probably small, enough for your feet. And initially there might be just a hole and then grass, hole, grass, but eventually it becomes a line of mud, doesn't it? And then, um, if I wanted to um, think, oh, well, there's something down that pathway, um, you know, you keep on going there more, and therefore you think, okay, I might sort of make, I might get my um, quad out and sort of drive down that. And so therefore, there's a big more of a, of a dirt, you know, it's a bigger track now, you can see. And then, you know, you've put some sort of, um, you know, established some things at, at the end of this track, some infrastructure and so forth and you continually go there readily so you think oh, I need to tar this I need to put a you know a decent road so I you know we can drive our car down now <clears throat> and so the track that was nothing turns into a road right but you know what if we continue on that road will turn into a super highway if we continue on that's what I'm saying if we continue on a pathway if we are to form habits of thought that enable us to resist temptation, we must learn to look upward. As we do this, we are creating a super highway in our brain mind. Now, the most interesting thing is, the old habit pattern might still be there. It might only just be a little tiny little thing. But as we build the new pathway, that little tiny thing that caused us so much grief now, we can start to identify the experiences that we're starting to have. And these are experiences of righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness comes from right thinking. So therefore, that's how we are changed moment by moment. We need a method of how Christ can work in us. It's one thing to say, yes, we need the character of Christ. But secondly, as I said, how is this going to take place? Okay, turn with your Bibles to, we're still on that point of habits of life. Matthew 25, 25, 9. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Go and buy. Faith and grace 
All these things are gifts from God. The only thing that we can do, the only thing that we have, is our will. And buying here represents our will. These people, these people that recognise this, the, the, the wise, they recognised that they were buying. They were choosing with their will, moment by moment. And they created an experience. And that's why it says, you know, why didn't you do this? It says, why didn't you buy? Go and buy. So there was a there was, a, there was a teaching, there was an educational thing that was going on. There was something that they were experiencing. Buying is the will. Okay, now, after we know that we form habits of life, the next thing is someone is going to be on our pathway and trying to take this away from us which is the great controversy. As soon as this educational system is starting to, in yourself, you're going to get opposition. And may we remind ourselves again about this opposition. In Ephesians 6.12, Ephesians 6 and verse 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickednesses in high places. There is an unseen battle going on, and it is a battle for your mind and your heart. We don't understand, but if we were to see what was going on behind the scenes, we'd be shocked. Ellen White saw this, what was going on behind the scenes. There's a war going on. Revelation 12, 7-9. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7-9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was there found place any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Notice this here. He deceiveth the whole world through sorceries, through the image of the beast, through long philosophies, through false doctrines, and so forth. And that leads us to number six, which is faulty belief systems, or and faulty doctrines. There are a lot of faulty doctrines out there, but also a lot of people have a lot of faulty belief systems. When they measure their own thoughts, not in regards to doctrine, but just ideas that they have, don't line up with the Word of God. There are 40 belief systems, and this can be expanded to 40 doctrines. One aspect of this in regards to 40 belief systems is a definition of madness is to keep doing the same things but expecting different results. If you keep on doing the same thing, thinking that you're going to change, but you're doing the same things, and but you, but the whole thing is, and you're expecting different results. So that's a definition of madness. Keep on doing the same things. We need, if, we, if that's the case, we've got to do something differently. And these particular things could be physical things that we need to do. If it's in regards to people, there might be associations we've got to cut ourselves off from, or whatever, whatever that, those things are. We need to do something. Faith without works is dead. Another thing is, as well, if you believe Christ's human humanity was different to yours in some way, if there's some slight change to that, if you believe that Christ's humanity, that what he has, was completely or somehow part different, if there's some difference there in regards to the humanity, I'm not talking about the divinity, in regards to the humanity, if there's some 
aspect of that that is also faulty doctrine, faulty belief systems. Therefore, you cannot completely have a victory. Okay, number seven is present truth. Present truth. It talks in regards to present truth is what is the Bible focused on, which is present truth. In regards to the focus. Now, there are a lot of this is what we we're talking about today in Timothy. We we're talking about this very aspect of the babblings and so forth and the things that don't really bring about a change in someone's life. They're just, they could be, they could be just um, precious truth. It doesn't make my character change. But present truth, and I can say this, present truth is salvational. Present truth is what we need. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 12. 2 Peter 1 and verse 12. It says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in present truth. It says, be established. Established in this area. In early writings, page 63, I'm not going to read the whole page, but you can go home and study this, but I want to bring out two aspects of this, and you can look at this yourself. She says, there are many precious truths contained in the Word of God. Notice, you know, precious. Precious truths contained in the Word of God. But it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the dangers of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to enter the cause. But notice this. These are the subjects. These are the subjects, Victor, when you were talking about last week, the three angels' message that it comprises of. But such subjects as the sanctuary, in connection with the 2,300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and to show what our present position is, to establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to the glorious future. Notice this. These have I frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. Notice that. She frequently seen. She just didn't have... Um, sometimes, like in this aspect, she was frequently shown. That's what I'm saying. Education is something that we need again and again. Why did God instruct her and show her frequently? Frequently seen. These were the principal subjects. In regards to the faith of Jesus... Original sin teaching destroys this aspect of the faith of Jesus. Okay, number eight. What do you think eight is? Eight laws of health. <clears throat> eight laws. Now, eight laws of health. Also, it was also um, summarised as New Star. A lot of people can talk about also called the eight doctors as well. Now, in these eight laws, um, we have one thing I want to bring out um, was nutrition deals with the N of New Start. Now, with nutrition, um, it's a matter of looking at things. Are we having things in their whole complete state? Are we having a part food? Or a whole food? You know, are we having all the add-ons? Are we having things like margarine? Even Nutilex is the same as margarine. Are we having good oils? Are we having our celtic salt instead of table salt? Are we having good water? Are we opening up our windows when you're in the bedroom? Like, you know, to sleep. I, I'm an electrician and I put fans in people's bedrooms and I can tell you, probably I'd say 
1% of people actually have their windows open, even cracked open. The air in, in, in uh, bedrooms are so toxic, they're worse than the smog outside. So the air inside someone's home, if you don't open up windows, if people don't have windows, that air is just circulating again and again. You would probably move probably, I don't know, three or four times that amount of air for your lungs in a room, an average room maybe. If you don't, so the windows, even in winter time, if you can, crack it open. In summertime, when we have the air conditioners on when they're hot, we still open up our windows. Because that air conditioner is not pu pulling like a split, is not pulling air into from the outside to the end. It's only recirculating in the fan that's there. So these are the whole things. It's uh, uh, the air that we breathe is very important. And a, a latter study of that is that there was a Dr. Potato in Russia that noticed that um, people that were on their last legs developed asthma because in their last legs they started to over-breathe and that caused asthma. So the potato method is if you actually change your breathing and learn how to breathe properly through your nose, then you can eliminate asthma. Things are very simple. And there are actually people do that here in Australia in various places, they teach this sort of thing. Okay, so after now people have a health message now they start to see that there is some sort of purpose to life. Now they start to see that life is more tangible, that they can, they've got this hope, they're realising, they're studying about um, where they are in time and what Christ wants to do for them and they're starting to get feeling better because now they're into the, the health message and so forth and now they start to realise that they have a purpose to life and the next question they might ask themselves which, which was said, said here today they realise that they are saved to serve that's our true purpose to life we are saved to serve others number 10 is follow your conviction individually now people might start to see where they are who they are in Christ, they might start to see that they don't have to be controlled by another person or another system and so forth. And they start to work out their own pathway, if you like, with Christ. And so they follow their conviction. A lot of the times when gifts might be tried to be um, established, it might be recognised, you might have an impression that that is the right thing to do. Um, if I relied on other people to try and encourage me, I tell you, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be presenting this today to you. But I had to follow my conviction because the people that I did speak to about this and the people I got results with did blossom. There are um, aspects that there's people that we know, Fiona, that we've helped. Um, there's various aspects. And I utilise these 12 points and I find out what that person needs if the person's not Adventist I don't you know put this out in a big study I just in my mind I go through and say okay that person needs some whatever and I'll work that out and then eventually I hope that they will learn about this so follow your conviction is most important that you've got to follow what God wants you to do if you believe it's truth you need to follow it individually because God's got a purpose for you. And number 11 is this will produce your gifts and your talents. So therefore, individually, God wants to reveal to us individually what our gifts are, what our talents are. We might know yet what they are. But God wants us to um, follow our conviction, see what gift it is. And if we see a gift, something, an aspect of the church, whether it be healing, whatever it is, hospitality, administration, we need to encourage that gift. Encourage it by just a simple word, whatever it is. Encourage that gift. 
Because if we do this, if we do this, then this will create number 12, which is the true body of Christ. The true body of Christ. So from hope all the way through to number 12, to the true body of Christ, there is a lot of aspects in regards to the true body of Christ. And if we turn in our Bibles to Ephesians 5, 27, that he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is a very tall order. You know, in my own life, I know that I fall short of his glory. There's certain things that we're totally um, wanting to, to change. You know, I'm not standing here saying that I have a right because I have not. But the Bible says that he might present it to himself a most glorious church. When we think of this tall order, when we think of this aspect, God will do this. God, I believe, we should have faith that he is allowing this to take place. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So when he appears, here we have those that, that group of people that see Christ come. They will totally reflect his character. Okay. So I've just got a statement of my own summary here in regards to the talk keys, principles. The 12 key principles are keys that highlight the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, which is present truth. These simplify the Advent message to all classes of people and to make them stand firm in these last days. Now, this is what I want to show you. The American Psychiatric Association was started in 1844. Is that interesting? And you'll see there, there is 13 stars. They were the 13 founders of this organisation. Why did it start in 1844? Not 1842, not 1843, not 1858, 1843. Was it designed to counteract? Was it designed to counteract a message that was going to be given to the weakest of the weak? Was it designed to set up, to put people in prison, to make them um, slaves and souls of men to divide the church? I wonder. I've got to find out more about this. But it's very interesting. I only found this out about two weeks ago. And there's that statement again. Okay, in Psalms 113 verses 7 and 8, it says, in summary, takes the poor out of the dust, the needy out of the dunghill, and it talks that the princes of his people is the 144,000. So the people that are in the dust the circumstances of life and the dunghill circumstances of life, and you can think whatever that makes up in your mind, these people become part of the 144,000. So therefore, there has to be a message that enables people to stand and to allow them to have their voice. Their voice needs to be heard. 
Now notice this question here. If there is no message available to repair the princes of his people, can Christ come? If there is no message to repair, like we talked about in Psalms 113, if there is no message to repair them, can Christ come? And the answer is absolutely no. Okay, C. Remember, A, B, C. This is C. Forming the princes of his people. Forming, making them established, requires teaching. In Matthew 24, it says, And this gospel shall be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end shall come. Just, this was the result with um, that sister in regards to um, time setting. When I talked to her about this word witness, what this truly means, then I saw there was an understanding about what this witness truly is, how it comes about. And sure, we have the element of seeing that it was wrong, no question about it. But when the witness was understood, what it meant, what Christ was supposed to be doing in us and for us, then all the attention went on the word, oh, that I've got to be a witness. We can't, Christ can't come unless that witness is in his people. It's quite simple when we view it in regards to the 12 points. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12 and verses 9 and 10. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Notice this. Something is going to be closed up to the time of the end. This thing that is sealed up to the time of end is going to cause many shall be purified and made white and tried. They're going through an experience. They're preparing themselves. It says the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. So people will say, well, that's not important. What are you doing that for? Whatever it is, doesn't really matter. But the wise shall understand. They will hear Christ's voice. They will see if it actually is true. They will resonate in their heart. They won't quiver if a message has to be repeated again and again. So in teaching, we have to implement a program and a vision. In, in teaching, I see a way, and this is what Fiona is working on at the moment, Fiona is um, trying to get Aboriginal um, funding um, to get a property. Okay, and she's actually doing some, um, to get that funding, she's got to show that she's got certificates to the world that we can get funding. So she's doing that sort of thing so we can get funding. Once we get funding, we can possibly get a grant which gives us a property. Wherefore, we can take people back there. And, that, and we need this in Australia. We need something in Australia. And they will be, we see that the possibility that um, you could have all sorts of things there. You could have a, a restaurant, you could have cafe, you could have programs there, health programs. You could have people that have got no job, they can be cultivating the ground. So various aspects of the whole total 
message. Missionaries going out from there, giving seminars and so forth. It's big, it's our vision. Um, I cannot, um, even if it doesn't happen, I've still got to keep this in mind um, and go with this. But what I'm saying is teaching requires implementation of a program. These people got well, these people become the princes of the people. They weren't just changed by that. They heard, they understood, there was something that was given to them. There was a message. So there's strategies. Number two, there is strategies. And the strategies are a method. The, the strategies are repetitions of how we can be changed. When we went to school, we learned the ABC. How do we do it? Most of us probably sang the ABC over and over and over again. So we know it's in our mind. So likewise, when we're hearing a method of how Christ works in us, we need to hear it again and again, this way, aspects here and there. And that's why I'm saying, in early writing 63, why was Ellen White showing that? Frequently seen. She was frequently seeing something that we need to go over, those present truth subjects. And of course, there's outcomes. Outcomes is Christ's character. And the resources would be the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And anything else that would support the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to make it real and credible. Evaluations would be to checking and improving to see if it's right, um, seeing how we can change, and seeing how we can go on further and further. Now, remember, A was the character of Christ. To backtrack, if people don't realise that this, like, is important, a first has to be established. People have to realise the reason why we are here as a people is because we do not have the character of Christ, number one. That is our first platform to even consider. Not that we need something else. Yes, doctrine supports it. Yes, as we go, that's fine. But we have to at least come to the acknowledgement of this, that we need the character of Christ. Now, if we realise that, So if you're, if you're stuck on the first five areas and you don't see A, then it's, uh, the problem is, is that you will not have an experience that will enable you to hang on. Okay, now B is how is the character of Christ born? So people can say and they can preach. And they can say, yes, we need the character of Christ. But unless we're teaching and sharing how is the character of Christ formed in the church, then that's the next deception. See, the whole thing is, over the years, as I was getting at, Christ um, is trying to get it through to us that we needed to see the light that we needed the character of Christ. But people can be preaching that, and, if, and what I'm saying to you, if you don't understand that the message has to go to the weakest of the weak, and you hold just to A, can Christ come? No. So, B is how is the character of Christ formed in the church? C is forming the princes of his people. Now, the whole thing is, what I'm getting at, is that, um, and this was only revealed to me probably in the last year in regards to this, is that if we are in a church and we've come to the light that only we need to develop the character of Christ within the church and that's all we do, then that's not going to bring about the second coming of Christ. If we are, then the next step is to present how is it formed. 
And then if we don't have a message to actually go out and prepare the princes of his people, then that will also, what I'm saying to you is um, Satan will discourage if we do not know the full complete message. Because if that is not presented and not given to the world and allow them to be the 144,000, then Satan will have us. So C includes everything, everybody, and the restitution of all things. What I'm saying here, the message, if you have a message to prepare the forming of the princes of his people, which includes the weak. If you've got a message that does that, it includes every single person, every fact. It brings about a full, complete restoration to every single person, if they want it. What I'm saying to you is it doesn't mean to say that we're all going to hear. The sad thing is, a lot of people will go out. Notice this quote. In the world today, where selfishness, greed and oppression rule, many of the Lord's children are in need and affliction. In the lowly and miserable places surrounding, surrounded with poverty, disease and guilt, many are patiently bearing their own burden of suffering and trying to comfort the hopeless and the sin-stricken about them. Many of them are almost unknown to the churches or to the ministers. But they are the Lord's lights, shining amid the darkness. For these the Lord has a special care, and he calls upon his people to his helping hand to reveal, in hand in re, relieving their wants. Wherever there is a church, special attention should be given to the searching out of this class and ministering to them. <clears throat> I'm just giving you today one aspect, one aspect in regards to what it means to prepare an aspect of the 144,000. I'm only giving you one. That is my gift in this area. There are others. There are other areas that will support this particular thing, but all I'm sharing to you with all my heart is this is just one little aspect in regards to forming the 144,000 to the weakest of the weak. Christ's first missionary, before the disciples were even, they were bickering and carrying on as we talked about today, yet the demoniac went out and was Christ's first missionary. He was out. He was doing the work. So therefore, Satan has very cleverly took our eyes off the most important thing. He doesn't want us to see about the character of Christ. When we hear about Christ being formed in the church, how? He says, oh well, people just hear those things and just talking about the same thing again and again. And then to say that there's a message to repair the prince of his people, forming those thoughtless ones. Satan doesn't want that to happen because then he is finished. I hope today, at the conclusion of this meeting, I pray that you'll take something from this time. The message speaks to me as well. And may we consider these things of how Christ works in our lives, in areas that we can study, how we are to do it, where is the message going to go? And the Lord's, the Lord's hands reign upon the earth. May you join me in prayer, those of you who know me. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, 
we ask for your reign in our hearts. Your reign. As we consider to put all these things away that are severing our experience, may we have a hope and we consider to put these things, whatever it is, away that is severing our relationship with you, whether it be the imaginations of your heart, the imaginations, the things that we listen to over and over again, the wrong voices. May we listen to your voice. Help us to repair those people for your coming. For this we ask in the name of our Lord and Saviour, we pray. Amen.